Hi, everyone. We are so glad you're here. We've actually planned today with the idea of bringing glory to our Lord, and we're excited that you've joined us for worship. We've prepared all of our environments to point to one thing, our Lord Jesus Christ. If this is your first time here, we'd love for you to connect with us online. If you go to our website, you can find up-to-date information about everything happening around here. You can check out our page, follow us on Twitter, and like our Facebook page. These are great resources we'd love for you to use. We hope you enjoy your time today with us. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon. Well, good morning. You got to say it a little louder because you have a mask on. Good morning. I want you to raise your hand if it just feels good to be in some kind of normalcy that you haven't had in the last several weeks. And for those of you joining us online, uh, this is our live stream debut. If, uh, if we mess up sometime during this, you're going to see all of it, but we're, we're really trying to move forward with this. And it's just so great. If you're joining us online um, or in person and you're not on our e-news, I want you to just consider putting that because we've been communicating very heavily through that, as well as if you are a guest, whether online or here, we'd love to have you put welcome on there. And uh, I just want to say thank you for, for being here. We don't have child care, but I'm so glad you guys came. And, and it's just one of those pieces where we're, we're going to be community. We're going to move forward. So here's what I want to do for just a second. And then I've got a couple quick announcements. If you are, I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up. And we're, we're going to be six feet apart here, but go ahead and stand up where you are. And if you're at home, you can stand up if you want to. Um, and we're going to greet, but we're not going to move to do that. Because here's the deal. I checked with the CDC, and you cannot contract COVID-19 through eye contact. Okay? So I just want you to literally look around to at least five people and just wave and go, it's good to see you. Okay? So look around, make eye contact, and just wave. All right? That's awesome. You, you don't have to be quiet. It's not like a picture. But I'm so glad you guys are here, and um, we, we are going to jump right in the middle of what is going on today, what is God call us to in the midst of this. We've got a whole lot coming forward in the next couple weeks that I am just overwhelmingly excited about, and we'll share a little bit about that today, but um, more of that next week and moving forward. But if you would, join me in a word of prayer. Let's open up that way and, uh, and just dive right into this in a time of worship through song, in a time of worship through His Word. And uh, just, God, thank You for letting us be here together. Help us to be wise, Lord, both individually here within our body, but also as we go out, because there's never been a more tumultuous, a more uh, tense time than now with more uh, ideological conflict. And Lord, show us through Your truth today how You desire that we be your salt and light. How do we do that? How do we embrace your spirit within us that is the power to change the world? And thank you for all the, the details of today coming together. And Lord, give us wisdom even moving forward that we can gather more frequently and more completely. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Lost Mountain. Let's sing together. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over. My story's just begun. But failure won't define me. That's what my father does. Yeah, fail you won't define me. That's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the father's house, check your shame at the door. Cause it ain't welcome anymore. I 
devil's not the end game the journey's where you are you never wanted perfect you just wanted my heart and the story isn't over if the story isn't good failure's never final when the father's in the room yeah failure's never final when the father's in the room your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house had a great message the message is that our life, our journey isn't over because the Father's in the house, He can take anything let's sing this together prodigals come home the helpless find home Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors swing wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynicals find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho's walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Oh. Let's sing together. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won, for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you never failed me yet. I know the night won't last, your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again.
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again, made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again, seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. Made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. I never will forget that you never fail me yet. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art. this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are great. We praise you because you're great. We thank you for being here among us because we've gathered in your name. Once again, ask your anointing on Ken as he brings your word to us. And may we not just listen, but may we be doers of the word as we hear your word spoken to us this morning. That's my prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Bob. I love hearing clapping. I love hearing people. The last several weeks have been great. How many of you have seen at least one service online in the last several weeks? Awesome. And I, and I know that you are clapping at home as well, but man, it's just good to see people. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the chairs and they look great, but seeing people is awesome. Um, last night, we had a little bit of a celebration at my house. At my house, we, we celebrated my oldest son graduating from the University of Georgia, and I'm so proud of him, and it was great, but instead of walking with a cap and gown with hundreds of his fellow students in a stadium to celebrate, we, uh, we had it in our living room, 
And, and it, we had a great time. How many of you like fondue? Does anybody else like the fondue? If you've never fondue, don't knock it till you try it. It is a blast. It is a wonderful time. And as we sat around and celebrated Graham and celebrated that, I couldn't help but think of another time that uh, with each of my kids, I'm in the process of when they get to a certain age, going, this, this is a time where I want to pour into you or share with you just a piece of me. At the pivotal points in my life, God used different truths, different verses, different chapters, and different truths at the pivotal points in my life. When, when I was getting out of debt, some of those, when I was a single guy in my late 20s thinking, where am I ever going to get married? What God used there, and as, as I went through life, these pivotal times, and I've written them down in just a small book, these verses, these chapters, these pieces, and and. This, when you hit some of those times and you're thinking, God, where do I go? Look at these truths. I did that with my second son, Cody. He was a couple of years ago, he was out in Colorado and he was at a, a turning point in his life and working at a camp out there. And this camp, they would work six, basically six and a half days a week. And they got this one break and I was out there one time where he had actually two days off. And I was actually out there uh, for work, and we spent two days together, and I thought, Lord, this is the perfect time. So I finished up his book, just like the one I have for Graham. I finished up his book, and we'd gone to a ball game. I said, hey, I've got an idea. Now, we like to play disc golf, and I've shared this once before, but in case you weren't here that Sunday, I said, what, what, would, what do you want to do tomorrow? He says, I, I don't know. What do you want to do? And I said, I've got an idea. I said, out here, disc golf is big. And I've mapped out, and there's like all kinds of courses all over the Denver area. What would you say to us trying to play 100 holes of disc golf in one day? And he said, I'm in. And that day we had breakfast, and we went to the first course, and I gave him his book. And I said, you know what I want to do? I want to take the disc, but I want you to take your book, and I want to read these verses as we walk. As we go on these, and I just want to tell you where I was in my life and where you'll be in these challenges. And we did that, and it was one of the most amazing days of my life. And, and I think she's got a couple pictures of just kind of what that was like. And I don't know if you've shown, did you show them already? Um, just the, the beauty of Colorado, and that's us starting out, and then the, just the, the majesty of what being in God's creation looks like. That's one of the holes and one of the courses. It was just this wonderful day. And what I've done for this past year plus here at Lost Mountain is I've literally taken that same concept and, and here's the truths that make all the difference and the points of life. And I believe that we're supposed to share life, successes, failures, struggles, and say, here's where I am. And we take that against God's truth and we go, God, what do we do now? Today is probably one of the most pointed of those times. And there's a chapter in Colossians that is so apropos today to give us the steps on what we need to be focused on and, and what we need to be about in the midst of what is going on right now that is unavoidable. If you forget everything else, you miss everything else, Colossians 3, don't miss it, and we're going to break it down in a second, but the bottom line is we need today more than ever not only hope, but to get to hope, I don't know if you watch the news, I try not to, but the overwhelming concept that comes to my mind is we need perspective more than ever. Because here's the deal, what is those differences and where we're not alike and where we live in the world but not of it and we live in a world that is quite fallen and all the intensity that's coming on and the chaos that's coming on and all the weight that our world is dealing with right now, we need a heavy dose of perspective. And how can we be that perspective? Well, it, it, I look at the idea of this, this concept of perspective and realize that we are very different, extremely different. How many of you are married? Raise your hands very quickly. All right, leave your hand up if you and your spouse are different in any way. All right, no hands went down, some went higher. I agree with that because we are different. And you not only take that, but there are some differences gender-wise, but there's also differences philosophically. 
And as I've sat back and observed, I've observed this because we're about to come into a political season of voting. And, and I've observed this. That on one end of the spectrum, you have those who, who have more feel-oriented. And there's the one side that, if you'll notice this, and I'm not condemning it, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying I've noticed this, that there's one side that is against whatever. We're against this, we're against that, we're against him, we're against her. And it's everything is against. And as on the other side is where I kind of lie, it's like, well, well, tell me what you're against, tell me what you're for. What, well, let's logically think through this. Well, no, 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 there's no logic, there's emotion. And I heard this when I was coming out of college, that if, if you're in your 20s and you're not uh, a liberal-minded person, emotional, then you have no heart. And if you're not conservative and a thinker by the time you're 40, you have no brain, okay? Those are the extremes. Now, I'm not saying I agree or disagree. It's just one of those pieces where we can change the perspective and we can hopefully become balanced in the midst. But I'll tell you this, only God gives balance. Now, one of my favorites happened a few years ago in the political realm when tolerance was the big cry. We need to be tolerant. You need to be more tolerant. We're tolerant. And there was a gentleman who did an a evening talk show, and uh, he was a comedy, he was a comedian, and he went to one of the conventions, and, and he says, so, I've heard this is the party of tolerance. Oh, yes, we are tolerant, and we are tolerant. And then he brought up one issue. I'm not going to tell you the issue, but he brought the issue up. And, and I love the response. It was over and over. It says, we are against that. And he says, well, I, I thought that you were the party of tolerance. And he says, no, that is intolerant, and we will not tolerate intolerance. And he says, well, isn't that by definition intolerant? And the guy's like, well, no. We only tolerate what is tolerable. And what we are against is intolerance. And, and he tried to get him to see it. He's like, well, don't you see that you are now deciding what is tolerance? And they couldn't get it. And the thing is, is we need perspective. We need that perspective. And when we get to that point, we have to realize what is driving this. And I don't know if you've come across this or not, but it is getting more intense, not less. To the point where there are those who are like, if you don't believe what I believe, if you don't think what I think, if you don't validate what I act, then you hate me and I hate you. That is just wrong. I, I, I'm beginning to think it might be some kind of superpower that God gives us who believe. And that is the ability to sit down with somebody that we can disagree with. And still respect them. And still love them. And still be their friend. Jesus was a friend to sinners. He greeted them with grace and truth. And what was amazing was, if you read encounters with Jesus over and over, he was simply with them, with grace and truth, and loved them, and change just happened. But it didn't happen on the big scale, because here's what I feel is the, the seeds of a lack of perspective. One is the idea that, and, and we've seen it during the COVID-19 time, the idea of stereotypes. Stereotyping is wrong. And, and I learned this when I was a sophomore in psychology class. Stereotyping. All jocks are dumb. All blondes are foolish. This, this idea of stereotyping. I know some athletes that are, are high-level doctors. They're the smartest people I know. I know some blondes that are unbelievably intelligent and are specialists in their field, in the medical field. And, and stereotypes are just wrong. And to, to group people together with the idea of just everybody, you guys and us, and divisiveness, it's just wrong. And in the COVID world, that's happening more and more. How many of you have seen that, being out and about? You're either a, everybody should wear a mask, or get over it, we don't need masks. And there's everything in between. I was at my pool at my neighborhood yesterday. And we walked in, and Kennedy and I had done some yard work. I'm like, I just want to cool off, chill down. 
And we jump in the pool. And some of you are going, I don't think you should be swimming. Pools shouldn't be open yet. Okay, so there's another division. But as I'm walking in and we put our towels down, one of my neighbors is in the corner, in the shade, with a cooler, beer in hand. I'm like, dude, you got the bird's eye seat. And he goes, yeah, I'm just trying to avoid the next outbreak. And he had a tone of seriousness. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, over there. And there were some neighbors talking to each other, probably less than six feet apart. And he's like, that's just wrong. He said, and then he went on a tirade. He said, I've been at the store, and there's people walking around without a mask, and they're getting inside of my six feet, and I just, I can't believe that. And I just thought, okay, let me make sure I'm not six feet here. But I just listened. Because here's the deal, stereotypically it's, it's the mask, the no mask, but when we get down and individually listen, we start to hear the why. We start to get perspective. We start to understand. See, my neighbor's wife in the last couple months had had a transplant. She can't get sick. It's very real to him. And it doesn't matter what the numbers say. The numbers right now are going in the right direction. They're going down. Hospitalizations are way down. Less than those today, you have a less than half of 1% of coming in contact with anybody with COVID-19. But here's the deal. It's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But what if you are that half of 1%? What then? It's individual. It's not collective. Stereotypes are wrong. And I would go one further than that. One of the pieces today that not only are stereotypes wrong, but racism is flat out evil. It's just evil. To, to divide based on the color of the pigment of skin that nobody has control over is just wrong and evil. And put those two together and saying, you know what? I, we need to just make sure we're not projecting anything on anybody for any reason. But I love the way that we're going to dive in today and say, well, if that's all true, then what do I do now? We need to realize, first and foremost, Jesus was not white. Jesus was not black. He was Middle Eastern. And I believe he did that on purpose. For a lot of purposes, but at that time in that moment. But I want you to listen to this one verse in the middle of Colossians chapter 3. It is the epicenter that if we want perspective, we need to take one of these five keys to unlock the door to perspective. And in the middle of there, in chapter 3, verse 11, it says, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. You either know Christ or you don't know Christ. That is the only division that matters. And it becomes very clear to us who believe, those who know him and those who don't. And our heart should be, we want people to know Christ so that we can have perspective. And with that in mind, there are five keys that unlock that perspective, and it's in Colossians chapter 3. I want to look through these very quickly. The first couple verses is kind of the main piece. And the first key is to set. Where am I setting? It says this in verses 1 and 2. Since then, we have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Setting our minds. Now I want you and I to evaluate ourselves right now and ask a simple question. How am I setting my mind and where am I setting my mind? Am I drawn to, now I'm not going to say what's wrong, I'm just going to say what is best and right. And then we can fill in and trickle with the rest. I watch TV, I watch shows, I binge watch shows and all that. But, am I setting my mind in that direction? I've gotten in a habit for the last several years. The first thing I want on my mind is His truth. Before I put my feet on the floor next to my bed to get up, I ask God to bring a verse to my mind. I try to go to sleep every night before I put my head on a pillow with a verse on my mind. I want my mind set on Him. Every morning I read a chapter before I do anything else. Before I turn any item on other than a light, I want to set my mind on Him. 
that idea of setting is huge. If you're an athlete, now let me ask you this. How many of you, I did not, how many of you ever, ever played football? Any, anybody play football? Okay, a few. You get in a huddle and you call a play, right? And then you get up to the line and you know the commands that are, that are pretty normal? Ready means get in position. And then what do they say next? Set. Set your mind. Remember your play. Individually know what you're going to do next and how. And you evaluate where the opponent is, what they're doing, and you evaluate to get set and then go. If you're a runner in a race, they say, runners, take your mark. That means get on the line. And then what's the next word they say? Get set. In other words, get focused on what you're about to do. Go. How many of you are like me and have lived many days waking up and going, ready, go, maybe set later. I don't have time to get set. I, I, I don't have the time. I don't have the, I just, I got to go. And we miss the point completely. And we're not prepared for the day. And we're not prepared in our minds or our hearts for what's going to happen. I'm not saying to watch more or less TV, but I'm saying this. What would happen if I took 10% of the time of what I watch and ingest, and instead of that put just reading the Bible, maybe talking with a friend about a passage, maybe talking about my life right now, what I'm worried about, and what verses have you read that apply to that? What if I took 10% of that? It would change everything. Let me, I've, I've used this illustration before, so if you know and you've seen it, don't yell out the answer. I want you to see how setting our minds affects the outcome and affects our ability to answer the true questions when they happen, okay? So this is going to be simple math, sub subtraction and addition, simple math. But in your minds, I want you to get ready for this, okay? Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to do some simple math, all right? Okay, so get in your mind. You're driving a train, and on that train there are 50 people. You got it? 50 people. At the first stop, 10 get off, none get on. Are you with me? Shake your heads if you're with me. Some of you are using calculators. I love that. That's great. At the next stop, 30 get off, none get on. You still with me? Shake your heads if you're with me. At the final stop, 10 people get on. Nobody gets off. Are you with me? Now here's the question. What is the name of the conductor? How many of you know the answer? Raise your hand. You know the answer. That's great. What is the name of the conductor? Yell it out. It's Sean. Why is it Sean? He said my, the name of the conductor is Sean. Because he's the conductor. Did you hear the first statement? You are driving a train with 50 people on it. And then we do the math and we go through the day. And when we get to the end, we can't answer the most simple of questions. Because we missed the point. We didn't set our minds in the right direction. Use that with your friends. It's a great dinner trick. But it's a great example of setting our minds. Am I there? Because when we set our minds on what is really true, we start seeing with perspective. Think about our current events. Think about the last few days. Think about the last week. We can see past the chaos. We can see past the noise. Is there unrest? Yes. Was there an event in Minnesota that was wrong and is being investigated? Absolutely. Does that need to be dealt with immediately and directly? Yes. But protest, not against that. Let's look at that. Let's listen to that. Do you know that the vast majority of protesters are completely and totally calm and right and they're doing it the right way? But if you watch the news, it's chaos and there's rioting in the streets. If you look at the footage and if you add up all of it, you've got maybe a couple thousand people that are absolutely doing wrong and are causing the chaos. But that's all the focus. But if we get the perspective and we step back and go, you know what, the, 
they are dealing with the injustice, absolutely. And they're dealing with it directly and immediately and correctly. And there are the protesters, and they are being heard, and they are peacefully going through that process. The perspective is that the vast, overwhelming majority is being handled correctly. But if we're not looking with the eye of perspective, we're missing the reality that I don't want to get swept away by the emotion and the lies of this. The first step is to set our mind. The second key, if you will, is in this verse, and it, it's a, a, an admonition to us. It's in verses 5 and 8, and the second is to eliminate. Not only set our minds on things above where Christ is seated, set our hearts on things above, not on things of earth. God, you're in control of this. And when you're in control, it says this, to eliminate. In verses 5 and 8, it says you want to self-examine. What do I need to eliminate? Put to death, therefore, in verse 5. Whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And then verse 8, it says, But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Well, let me ask you this. (laughs) That verse 8, does that describe what's going on today and is being portrayed? It is. And, and I need to ask myself, am I guilty of any of that? Lord, will you show me what I need to do? Identify it and then avoid it. This may be one of the most powerful verses because here's the deal. It's easier said than done to eliminate and avoid. To say, okay, Lord, avoid. I don't want to be there when it's happening. Lord, give me wisdom in that. We have to engage God in this area if we're going to eliminate properly and completely. It's learning to pray in the midst of that, Lord, I'm being tempted here. And I've shared this before too. A buddy of mine said, I can resist anything except for temptation. And I thought, me too. Because here's the deal. That temptation is when we either are going to pretend we're good enough and powerful enough and realize we're not. Or I'm going to step up and go, God, I, I, I can't. I'm overwhelmed in this. My emotions, my body is craving this. And that, if and when we decide to eliminate, is to say, God, help. That power that raised Christ from the dead, that lives in me, Lord, I I need that right now. And I need it all. And I'm telling you, when we do that as believers, he shows up. The third is to not only eliminate, to set our minds, eliminate that and ask God's help. But look what he says in verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as God has forgiven you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Those five words. Today, some of you listening in my voice are going to be just like I have done over and over. I'm like, Lord, help me live this today. Compassion. When I don't understand why people are so angry about something, instead of going, why why are you barking at me? Instead, be willing to listen first and say, hey, I I know I don't understand it all. Will you help me? And how can I show you that I do love you and I do care about you and you are safe around me and I will stand up for you and whatever you need. Help me understand. Help me see what you're going through. And, And through that individual contact of compassion, kindness, That word kindness I've shared before, I've shared this verse before, is to take a negative prompt and yet see past that anger or that anguish and see the need there and meet that need individually. The example I gave was the waitress who was very rude and uh, unattentive and my buddies were like, she doesn't want a tip and God was working on this kindness in me. I said, you know what, there seems to be something here and she came back very flustered. And she goes, do you need anything else? And almost didn't stop. And I said, well, 
you know what, here's the deal, we're good. But I can tell you're having a bad day. And I said, is there anything that we can do to help you? We're about to bless the food. Can we pray for you in something? And her whole countenance changed as she melted and shared how she was a single mom and her car broke down and her manager yelled at her and did just, she was just flustered. And I just saw her melt. That compassion and kindness, gentleness, humility going, you know what? What your feelings more than what I need to defend. Christ has already forgiven me. I'm good. How can I help you? I'm going to put myself second because Christ did that with me gentleness, patience. You know what? We don't have to resolve this right now. You just need to know that I'm with you. And I'm, I'm here. And I love you. If I can get that one verse, it's going to change everything. If we can get to that point where we live that, and then probably after we get the getting rid of eliminating and then and clothing ourselves, and, and it, it really is putting it on. It's like putting on clothes putting those five words on. This is one of my favorites. It's let. Let what is already in there come out. And it, it's in verses 15 through 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since you are members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ or the truth of Christ Dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs, and spiritual song, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Let. We need to let the truth of today. I would encourage you let that truth. Pick one of these verses and say, God, I want that to wash over me. I want that to be the last thing on my mind when I go to bed, the first thing when I wake up. And let my mind settle on it. Let it dwell richly in me. And let the peace of God, that peace is in us. The fact that he is in control in the midst of chaos. This ultimately is not it. And if we can see past the temporal into the eternal, we start to get a peace. It's just there for those of us who know Christ and have invited him into our lives. It's there. Let it come to the top. Look at the chaos with God's eyes and just go, Lord, you are peace in the middle of the storm. You're hope. You're there. Let it happen. Stop back and just let it. If I, if I could give a physical analogy of it, it would be like going to the doctor with a broken bone. And they, they set the bone and they put it in a cast. And they're like, well, what do I need to do now? Let it heal. Just let it heal. I've heard many doctors go, God made an incredible creation. He has created your body to heal itself, if you'll let it. What you have to do is just rest, and it'll heal itself, and it'll be stronger than before you broke it. In our world, in our chaos right now, if we will let the peace of God fill us, just let it happen. Sit back in His presence and go, Lord, I trust your truth, I trust this. That peace just overflows. It comes through his presence and his truth. And then finally, what do I do from there? In verse 23 and actually in verse 17 as well, it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. The Lord, not men. My focus is not to make other people happy. It's not to be the answer to all the, the questions. It's to be diligent with all my heart. Lord, as unto you. So that if people are looking, they see you. If they're not looking, I see you. And I'm just going to do it as if you're looking, period. I don't know which of those five keys that you need this morning, but I guarantee every one of us needs at least one of them. I would encourage you this week, go back and look at those keys. Realize two realities. One, that Christ has to be in our life if they're going to come to full fruition. It doesn't come from just a hard effort to do good. We're not good enough. Secondly, not only do, do, is his presence, but our active engagement with that. To take that truth and say, God, here's my situation. Here's your truth. Show me how to merge those together. If we'll do that, 
we're going to have perspective for today, peace that overwhelms in this situation. I'd like to pray for us, and then i got a couple, couple more pieces as we go, and I can't wait for next week, but you're going to want to hear this announcement. And, uh, but pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your truth, that it is transformational. You alone give perspective. You alone have the truth. You are the truth. Help us engage that in the area where we are most weak, most confused, and most needy. And Lord, speak to us this week through this amazing chapter of Colossians. In the name of Jesus, the power of the Spirit that raised him from the dead that lives in us who believe, we pray. Amen. We have a lot coming forward. In the coming weeks, we're going to announce.